Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is David Campbell. I am the chairperson of the Department of Political Science here at Notre Dame and a professor of political science. And I'll also be serving as the moderator for tonight's event. This is the second session of the Bridging the Divide speaker series, which is hosted by the University of Notre Dame's Provost Office in partnership with the Clow Center for Civil and Human Rights and the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy. Our aim in this series is to promote a more thoughtful conversation and some civil discussion in the run up to the presidential election, which of course we all know is happening on November 3rd. And regardless of where you might sit on the political spectrum, one thing that I hope we can all agree is that we will no doubt continue to be a divided nation even after November 3rd, regardless of which candidate prevails in the election. Well, our aim in this session is to explore some of those differences and divisions, some of the reasons behind them, some of the factors that contribute to them. And along the way, we hope to model civil discourse and to encourage respect for those who might hold a differing view from ourselves, to help us think more critically about some of those differences that we know divide Americans, and perhaps even find some ways that we can overcome those differences and recognize what might unite us as a nation. So throughout tonight's discussion, our theme will be civil discourse and respect for one another, and perhaps especially for those um, with whom we might disagree or might not always see eye to eye. Now, joining us for this conversation, first, my colleague in the political science department, Dr. Darren Davis. Um, Professor Davis, Darren as I'll call him tonight, studies uh, public opinion and political behavior. He's actually one of the nation's experts on political psychology, that is the psychological motivations that uh, form the foundation of why we behave the way we do in the political sphere, and why we believe the things that we do. I'm also pleased to be joined by Caitlin Conant, who is the political director for CBS News in Washington, DC, and a Notre Dame alum of the political science department, I'm proud to say. Um, Caitlin has worked closely with uh, Face the Nation moderators, John Dickerson and Margaret Brennan, and these days, uh, she's been quite busy because she guides uh, CBS's uh, political and campaign coverage. And so no doubt has many war stories that she can share from um, her experience. And I'm grateful uh, to both of them for joining us and to participating in our discussion tonight. So we've obviously had an incredible week <laughs> with just an unprecedented amount of news uh, coming out of the uh, election campaign and everything surrounded to it. And undoubtedly things will get even more interesting tomorrow as we have the vice presidential debate in Salt Lake City, which all of a sudden has taken on uh, a new urgency, I suppose, uh, relative to perhaps most vice presidential debates in years past. But I'd like to get us started with a question about the story that has dominated the news, obviously, for the last uh, few days, uh, namely the fact that President Trump has contracted COVID-19. And so, Darren, if I could start with a question to you. Is it possible that President Trump's contraction of COVID-19 and the fact that he was hospitalized uh, for the illness could this actually benefit him in the 2020 election? And just sort of more generally, what, what do you think the implications are of the fact that we've now seen the president hospitalized with the coronavirus? Okay, Dave, I see you want to start off with the really tough questions. Um, <laughs> I don't believe in softball. <laughs> so this is a question that has come up many times um, in the past uh, several days. And um, we were thinking that initially, that there may be some sympathy um, expressed toward the president um, after he was uh, first con after he first contracted the virus, but I think um, his subsequent behavior since he contracted the virus has pretty much assured that um, 
um, he, he will probably experience uh, more schadenfreude among individual voters, that uh, voters will see this as uh, sort of payback and kind of want their pound of flesh given uh, many of his statements um, um, before he contracted the virus. And um, so while it is certainly possible, um, it is not highly likely that the president will, will receive uh, any benefit or sympathy support. And that's an interesting contrast we should note to um, what's happened in uh, some other nations, maybe in particular uh, the UK. You'll remember that Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, contracted COVID-19 uh, in the earlier days of the pandemic. And uh, while he wasn't facing an election at the time, um, he actually did see his approval ratings go up, uh, presumably because of the, the sympathy factor. Obviously the dynamics in the UK are different, but it's interesting to note the, the contrast between those two. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. I think Boris John Johnson had a, had a um, very different um, political persona uh, before and um, Boris Johnson also was somewhat contrite following uh, his release from the hospital. Um, I don't think being contrite and the president of the United States go well together. So um, um, I, I don't think it's likely that uh, the president will, see, will receive any sympathy from this. All right. Well, let me, if I could move to you, um, Caitlin. As I mentioned, you have a front row seat to uh, everything that's happening in the political uh, maelstrom there in Washington, DC. So I thought I might start by asking you about tomorrow's debate between uh, Vice President Mike Pence and Kamala Harris. What do you see as some potential differences that might come out during tomorrow's debate? And just more generally, what, what do you think we should expect to see in this debate? As I suggested, it seems to have higher stakes this year than perhaps in years past. Yeah, I think that's right. And first of all, thank you for having me. It's so nice to be back with the Notre Dame community. Um, so I think when you, the way the news cycle moves, the debate was just last week. Um, it was last Tuesday, I believe. And since then, you know, the president was hospitalized with COVID. Um, the cycle is just nonstop. But to me, what was really interesting about the last presidential debate, the first, was that the president decided he was gonna come in as a disruptor. And he was going to try and bring chaos to the debate stage to try and knock Joe Biden off of his game. Um, but by bringing that chaos, he kind of played in to the things that we repeatedly are told that some of the people who voted for him in 2016, namely women, college educated voters, suburban voters, and independents, they might be okay with his policies, but they're not thrilled with his leadership style, which they describe as chaotic. So by the way he approached it, he actually didn't do anything to win back some of those voters that Biden um, has cut into his lead with since 2016. So having that be the back backdrop, tomorrow I think there's gonna be a call for more substance from both sides in the debate. Uh, we did a flash poll right after the debate and 70% of people, their main takeaway was they were really annoyed. <laughs> and I think since the, our conversation here today is about civil discourse, it makes sense. And I feel like we all watch the same debate because it's very distracting when people are interrupting each other and talking over each other and you can't even hear what the other person is trying to say. So I think both of the um, vice presidential candidates Vice President Pence and Kamala Harris will have that in mind going into tomorrow night. And again, with the backdrop of the president's health, the age of both these candidates, um, 77 and 74, I believe, um, these are younger. Um, both vice presidential candidates are younger, um, presumably um, healthier. And I think that is also a factor that people will be tuning in to see because all of a sudden that question becomes more serious given the latest news. Um, and they both are people who, you know, Kamala Harris ran for president this time. Um, I think she obviously has big political um, ambitions and Mike Pence has been on the campaign trail, a main focus of the presidential campaign. So looking ahead to 2024, I think we can reasonably 
assume that they could potentially be two of the top contenders, um, no matter who wins or loses this cycle. So I think all of these will make this a much more uh, interesting vice presidential debate mm -hmm. than we're seeing. Yeah, in my own sense is that this is probably the most anticipated vice presidential debate probably since uh, 2008 when uh, Sarah Palin faced off against uh, Joe Biden. As I said, you know, historically, the vice presidential debate has been more of a sideshow, but all of a sudden it seems like we're going to be more attentive to it. Um, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I should say, Darren, if you have any thoughts on the vice presidential debate, I'm more than happy to bring you into this conversation as well. Um, do you think that we're going to see something different tomorrow night than what we saw last week? Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, every time I think of uh, VP candidates, I think of um, the old traditional political scientist, V.O. Key. And V.O. Key wrote in Southern Politics that the number one reason why presidential candidates select vice presidential candidates is because of the friends and neighbors voting. That, that president, presidential candidates used to select VP candidates because they happened to be weak in certain states and just wanted to shore up support. I think it's fair to say that we've really gotten away from um, sort of purposeful selection of VP candidates. And so um, I don't have much to add to that, but um, um, I do think it's one of the highly anticipated mm -hmm. um, VP debates that we've seen in probably since 2008. Um, I just have to note to the audience, um, the name V.O. Key, which may not mean much to non-political scientists, um, he is like the patron saint of political <laughs> science. So kudos to Darren for working in a reference to V.O. Key in this discussion. And for, for those of you who don't know V.O. Key's work, you, you should go read it because uh, he wrote a long time ago, but he had some really smart things to say that still apply. Um, but I'm gonna move uh, on to a different question. And Darren, I'd like to come back uh, to you. Um, Another question that I suspect is maybe not a softball. Um, so if you think back to what we heard in 2016, there was a lot of talk about Obamacare and about building a wall and Benghazi and immigration. And then if you look at 2018 in the midterms, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, this caravan of folks that was heading toward uh, the US border. But this year, we actually haven't really heard so much about those issues. And so my question is, what do you think the major issues will be or are in this election? And is it possible that this race is going to come down more to the candidates' personalities than necessarily to the issues? So again, what issues do you think are at play here? And then secondly, are they going to matter? Does it really just come down to the personalities? Well, I think one um, obvious issue will be um, COVID. 19. Um, and I think another issue um, will be uh, perceptions of law and order. Um, we no longer have the immigrant caravan, as you mentioned. Um, um, as we saw last week during the presidential debate, uh, it really wasn't about the issues. It was more about candidate personalities and um, and the issues just really took a backseat. And so, um, and I think that's probably the, re the reason, one of the reasons why voters are so annoyed by the presidential uh, debate last week. Um, but other than um, trying to make law and order um, and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as issues, I really don't think um, any other issues are going to percolate up to the top. So um, I really think this will be an issue less, uh, for the most part, an issue less um, election in 2020. It is striking to me that um, for all that we've discussed over the last uh, few years during the time of the Trump administration about manufacturing in the US and about trade and about immigration, um, 
it is striking that there really has been far less discussion of those issues because it seems like COVID has just dominated everything. Obviously not exclusively, but that does seem to be the, the, the general sense. Um, Caitlin, can I turn to you? And of course, I'm happy to hear um, thoughts on that point as well, but I thought I might ask a question that steers us in a, in a slightly different direction. Um, given your perspective of someone who is in the media world, are there issues where you think the parties disagree more than, than you would have expected? And similarly, are there areas where there's actually more agreement between the parties than maybe we might realize or that people might expect? So how much disagreement do you think there is? And is, are there surprises there? And is there any surprising agreement? So I'll start with just piggybacking off the last question quickly. I think both, I'll say the Biden campaign has made this election a referendum on President Trump, um, temperament, leadership, also a referendum on now his handling of the coronavirus. And I think when we talk about the issues and as Darren said, part of the reason people were annoyed in the debate last week, I think it all seemed kind of petty. Um, with the backdrop of all the big issues that we're facing right now. Um, people have lost loved ones. People aren't at work. They've lost jobs. They're working full time and raising their kids who aren't in school. So I think those are the issues. I would just add the economy to Darren's list, which is part of COVID, but those are really the two that we hear. And also another part that um, COVID has um, shined a light on deep divides and fissures in our, na in our nation over race um, and racial inequality, economic inequality. Um, and I think that is something that will also be a factor this election. Now, because I think both sides um, tend to uh, just not agree on most things these days, things are overly politi politicized and you're on one team or the other for the most part. And I think voting by mail which is another part of this pandemic, um, that there are changes being made by states. All states have different rules on how people vote. And so there is litigation, there are different rules on when votes will be start being processed, when they'll actually be counted. Um, the president has messaged that uh, he thinks vote by voting by mail is riddled with fraud. And so that's something where we see in our polling that more Democrats are willing to say they will, will vote by mail and more Republicans wanna vote in person. And I think that's a very clear example to me on something as simple on how you vote, um, where everyone is in agreement, they wanna vote, um, but there are stark divides. And that's been really surprising to me just on the mechanics of voting to see that. Um, and we don't see that much agreement. I mean, honestly, I'm thinking back to that debate poll. There was agreement that everyone was really ticked off and annoyed. But when it comes to the issues, um, I think one thing I'm curious to see play out is will COVID and public health be more of a factor or the economy? Because President Trump still has an edge in most of these battleground states of people who say who can better handle the economy. Um, and that's something that I think we've seen Joe Biden start to message on more. Um, and to the law and order point, it's actually really interesting. I was talking to my team today um, because the Trump campaign has also started talking about the economy more. Um, I think they know that's an issue that they can win on and gain ground on. Um, and they've really cut back on law and order. Honestly, right before we started talking, one of my reporters texted me and she said she was just going through all the Trump Facebook ads and she couldn't find one that was still out there tar targeting law and order. So seems like there's been a pivot in that message. I don't know if that will continue or if it was just what was happened to be up today. Um, but that's definitely something I'll be monitoring. Interesting. Um, for those in the audience who are um, alumni, and I'm guessing that's many people viewing this, you might be interested to know that um, I'm actually teaching a class on the 2020 uh, presidential election. So uh, it's truly teaching on a high wire without a net because uh, you really never know what you're going to talk about until <laughs> right the day before. Um, and after the presidential debate last week, um, my team teacher, Jeff Lehman, and I, we actually decided to change a paper topic. We were going to have the students write about something different, and we decided instead to have them write a paper on what they think should be done with presidential debates. Should we even have them? If we do, should there be some change in the format? Should there be different rules, et cetera? So 
um, it'll be interesting to see what, what the students' reaction uh, will be now that we have had this sort of national moment where people are recognizing that uh, last week's debate almost universally has been, has been panned. Um, I'm gonna pivot actually and, and, and go to a, a different topic. Again, my theme here, Darren, is I, I like to ask you the, the tough question. So here's another one, uh, but it seems appropriate to ask this at a Notre Dame event. So let me ask about the Catholic vote. And maybe the right question to ask, is there a Catholic vote? Or more broadly, how do you think Catholics are gonna vote in 2020? How should we understand this large group of voters that I'm guessing is of uh, interest to our audience? Hey, so Dave, that is not fair. It's a, it's a tough question, but it's a question that can potentially get me in trouble too. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I still asked it, so you're on the record. You're going to have to answer it whether you like it or not. Um, so because of, of Biden's uh, uh, Catholic identity, um, it's going to be tough and it's going to be close. Um, the vast majority of Catholics actually identify today as Republicans. They didn't always used to identify this way but upwards of 60% of Catholics identify as Republicans. And what that means is that uh, the vast majority of Catholics political and social attitudes actually align more with the Republican party than the church. I don't know if I'm gonna get in trouble by saying that, but at least that's, that is what the data shows. So, um, <clears throat> um, but I think Biden uh, will be able to secure um, um, and take away some of the uh, Republican Catholic vote. Um, and I think it's gonna be close. And actually, um, I think it's too close to call actually. Um, let me just ask a question about maybe the elephant of the room when it comes to uh... Catholics in the presidential election this year, and that is the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, of course, a Notre Dame law professor, uh, to the, the Supreme Court. And I'm actually curious to hear from both of you whether you think Barrett's nomination will have any bearing on the presidential race, and specifically whether or not you think that the fact that she is not just a nominal Catholic, but is known for being quite a devout Catholic and obviously comes out of the Notre Dame environment, which is obviously deep, uh, deeply steeped in Catholicism, whether that might move the needle at all on the Catholic vote. I can start if you want, Darren. Please, go ahead. Go Please. Ahead, <laughs> I just got to say, but not necessarily on the Catholic vote angle, but I think the Supreme Court and having a story to tell on appointing conservative justices is something that the administration thinks is a good thing, is leaning into. I think down ballot Republicans um, want to be talking about it and that uh, it's something that President Trump ran on, then candidate Trump, I should say, in 2016 in the midterms. Um, the, the Republicans who ran the senatorial campaigns in a lot of those races, they credit um, Kavanaugh's nomination to that, that it really motivated their base and created some enthusiasm. And again, I think to some of those conservative leading voters who want a conservative justice, but don't really care for the president's rhetoric, um, this gives them a reason to, to vote. Um, so I think Republicans would like to be talking about it. Now, again, that's all said, but the caveat that that was just last Saturday and like 10 other major news events have happened since. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see what happens in the next coming weeks. Um, and if it happens before the election, um, that matters too, I think, because for some of those voters, you could have your cake and eat it too. Um, so that's how I'm looking at it. Does this um, help bring back any of those independent suburban voters who um, have really been leaning towards the Democrats since 2016? All right. Um, any other thoughts on you know, Dave, the nomination? I, you know, I would echo those same uh, sentiments, actually. Um, 
I really believe that uh, the reason why uh, Trump has the support he has is because uh, people are willing to look the other way on many of the other issues and and they think Trump's ability to fill court appointments to be paramount. Now, will that have a significant effect in 2020? I think at Notre Dame, um, we are well aware of uh, Barrett's um, Catholic, Catholic identity. Um, we've made a very big deal about it, but I think the rest of the world, the rest of the country hasn't. Mm -hmm. um, so here at Notre Dame, I think it's important to us, um, but outside of Notre Dame, um, I don't think it's been getting that great of uh, press attention. Um, thank you uh, for those observations. I, obviously, it, it's been interesting that Notre Dame has been so much in the news uh, <laughs> lately, and I, um, you know, we all have an eye toward our own institutions, but I think it really is has been the case uh, that uh, we, we've seen a lot more mentions of Notre Dame in the context of presidential politics uh, this year than perhaps we have in the recent past. Um, Caitlin, I'm going to turn to again to a, a, a different topic, um, one that might speak to the state of polarization in America today. Um, I'm curious about what you think the lessons learned by the media would be coming out of the 2016 election. We, we have a highly polarized country in, in so many ways. Even the media environment is so much po uh, can be considered quite uh, politically polarized. And I'm just wondering from inside the media business, are there things being done differently? Were there lessons learned? Your thoughts? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think in 2016, the media, I think, was fairly criticized for not listening. And there were a lot of people out there, it turns out, who felt like they hadn't been listened to, uh, who felt like they'd been overlooked, um, who were standing in line to vote for Donald Trump. Um, and we just, you know, I think there were certain elements where we did our job and we were talking to people, but we needed to do a better job. And that is something that I started this, I guess I became political director. I've been at CBS for four years and I started in this role in 2018. This is my first presidential cycle. <laughs> um, it's been crazy. Uh, but one thing I really wanted to stress is that we need to get out of the coast and talk to people and report what we see and don't be afraid to speak up if it's event against conventional wisdom. And I will tell you, COVID is obviously terrible. I don't have anything to complain about compared to many people. Um, but one of my biggest concerns when all of this happened is I couldn't send reporters on the road for a really long time. And I was terrified that we were gonna repeat the same mistakes as we did in 2016 and not be out there in Ohio and Georgia and Michigan and Wisconsin uh, and Nevada and Arizona and Florida and actually listening um, and making sure that we were getting both sides um, of, of the story. And so one change I had to make really early on is basically as soon as everybody was sent home and most of our campaign reporters are, are young, this is their break. I'd say they're between probably 25 and 30. So they'd given up their apartments for two years thinking they were gonna be on the road and many of them ended up back home with mom and dad <laughs> um, because they didn't have a place to live. And I told them, I know this is gonna be extremely difficult, but you are assigned these states. And as part of that, you would do what you would do if you were living there and source up with the campaigns working in those states, get to know the mayor's office because that's gonna hard to do from a national reporter standpoint anyway, and even harder when you're not living there and have to do it over Zoom instead of taking someone out to coffee. But secondly, we set up a project called the COVID Chronicles where part of their job was just to talk to people um, and do reporting for .com. Some of them um, ended up being used in the broadcast too, but where they went to certain states and looked at an industry in that state, I'm thinking Colorado, tourism, talked to people who had lost their jobs, 
and then followed up with them over time where it wasn't an overtly political story, but it taught us something about how people felt about the country, federal government, whether they just thought they were being left behind by both parties or not, um, because that was something I felt very strongly about. And now I'm fortunate they're traveling again, they're in the States, we have safety protocols and are being really cautious and it makes a tough job much, much harder <laughs> mm -hmm. to do a dance of where people are and if they need to be in quarantine. But I'm really thankful that we got started early because I feel better that we were listening to people. Let me ask a question. Um, this is kind of a, a political science-y question, but I'm interested in the perspectives from both of you. One, a card-carrying political scientist. The other, a political science major, but someone who comes at this from the perspective of a, of a media person. But there's, a, there's kind of a debate that goes on among scholars over the degree of political polarization among regular folks, among rank and file Americans. So virtually everybody agrees that um, elected officials are quite polarized and there's all sorts of evidence on that and what exactly that means. But it's a less settled question whether or not once you get down into what regular voters believe and how they behave, whether it is accurate to describe them as polarized. And I'm, Caitlin, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective as you hear from the reporters who are out in the field, would they say that Americans in general are as deeply polarized as they're often characterized? Or is there a different story there? And, and Darren, I'm interested in your thoughts on whether you think that this is really just something at the top or whether we really do see it all the way through the population. So let's start with, with Caitlin, because I'm curious about what you're hearing from your reporters. Yeah, look, I think it's a tough question uh, because you have people who are super passionate and go to, you know, I'm thinking pre everything, but who go to rallies and are very politically engaged and I think have a side. Um, then there are people who kind of watch the news when they can, uh, but are just trying to get by <laughs> and get dinner on the table. Um, and I try and talk to just in my personal life, like during the debate, I know we keep talking about last week's debate, but I was texting my friend who, uh, I know just doesn't pay attention that much and was watching that night to get a gut check from her on what she thought. And I think that that's important because I think at the end of the day, what we've seen when we put people together in focus groups, and again, this goes back to listening. Um, I think if people are sitting down with each other and actually are hearing not just talking points, but where someone's coming from, the context of their situation, it makes it much tougher uh, to be nasty. Um, and to so we've tried to do that. Um, Face the Nation's good about doing focus groups. They had one last week it's over Zoom now. <laughs> um, not necessarily sitting together, but that's one thing I think that always really, you know, you see time and time again when people sit down together. It, you know, we had one in 2016, I'm thinking back, John Dickerson did one in Philadelphia and they actually started a Facebook group, Facebook group and stayed in touch. Um, and they were from all different sides of the political aisle. So I think it just gets back to A, how engaged are we talking of a voter here um, on which side? And also just when given the opportunity, does that kind of change the rhetoric if you're not behind a screen or on Twitter and are actually sitting down and talking to somebody? Thank you. Darren, from, from your perspective, um, what do you think? How, how polarized are Americans? So I'm going to come at this from a different angle. Um, I teach a public opinion class. Um, I've been teaching this public opinion class for the past 10 years. And I used to have an assignment. Um, and I had to discontinue the assignment because it was too difficult. What I would ask the students to do was to go to a public opinion poll and try to find an issue where Democrats and Republicans agreed <laughs> and <laughs> or where a consensus of Democrats and Republicans agreed and um, um, those opinions were non-existent. But <clears throat> I will say this, um, there is not complete polarization in American society. 
American citizens still agree on abstract ideals. We still agree on um, issues pertaining to the Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, things of that nature. But where the polarization breaks down is in the details. So we as American citizens, we can continue to agree on the abstract ideals, but we continue to disagree on the details. When we are challenged to apply those abstract ideals to specific situations and to practice what we preach, that is when they break down. There is, there is increasing polarization around those issues, but we actually give lip service a great deal to these abstract ideals. Thank you. Um, this has been a very illuminating conversation and I appreciate you fielding my questions, whether they be softballs or not. Um, but I'm actually going to pivot now and turn to some of the questions that have been uh, submitted by uh, members of our audience. Um, I'm going to do my best to get to as many of these as possible. I won't be able to get to all of them and I apologize in advance uh, for those questions that won't be answered. But let, let me start with one. Um, we have one audience member um, who has reminded us that tonight's topic is actually on political polarization in America. And this person is asking, why is it that our families and neighbors seem to have such difficulty holding civil and respectful dis discussions? And I'm gonna quote the question as they have in the past. And I guess the first question is, did we have those conversations in the past? And if we did, what's different today? And is there anything we can do to kind of overcome that so that there is a return to um, civility in our you know, more familiar relationships as compared to what you might see on television or at a presidential debate, but what you might experience over the you know, backyard fence or at the local diner, back when you know, we used to go to diners and talk to people over the fence. So I'm actually curious to hear from either of you, whether you think there is anything that can be done to promote more civil and respectful discussion. Well, Dave, um, I think you should answer the question because I think this is your area. <laughs> I'm, I'm merely a poser. Uh, <laughs> I am happy to say something about it, but let me see. Um, Caitlin, if you have any thoughts on it, I'm happy to bring you in, but I, I could maybe give a thought or two. You know, it's a, again, a tough question. I think that part of the reason I think there are, we do see such divides is, you know, I think with the media, um, you can choose your own news these days. And if you want to just hear one side, if you want to just watch Fox, or you want to just watch MX, MSNBC, or read Breitbart, or read Vox, um, you can do that. Uh, I think CBS, in, you know, is down the middle. I think what we try and do is bring context, um, bring history to our reporting, because it's a lot of... Uh, just the day that was in many cases and not the why of why you should care. Um, and so in, in my opinion, I think the more you can read, the more you can watch, the more you can consume and get a better picture. Um, and that's on all of us, self-included. Um, that helps with part of the conversation. Um, but again, I don't know how to, how to change that. That's all individual yeah. behavior and choices. Well, Darren opened the door for me. So I'm gonna walk through that door and give a thought or two if I could. Um, and I, I think Caitlin is entirely correct as she points to um, the increasing cocooning of people's media worlds. So yes. they get their news you know, from one side or the other, or maybe from CBS, right, right in the middle. Um, but I would suggest uh, two things, one, I'm not entirely sure that conversations in the past were always civil. Um, I think that we've had in American history, many periods of tumultuous political unrest, probably in the living memory of many of our audience members. Um, you know, I don't think things were necessarily civil in the 1960s as people were debating Vietnam and civil rights. And um, you know, we can point to other points even more recently where perhaps there's been disagreement. But one thing that I do think is different and does point to something that might help in the future is I do fear that as a people, we have become um, worse 
at being able to engage with one another when it comes to disagreement. And I think an example of that would be in our schools, uh, often students are not exposed to the actual debate of people with differing perspectives. Um, I've done a little bit of research myself that shows that that's actually one thing that does foster a greater appreciation for what is at the heart and soul of all politics, which is conflict. We should remember that's what politics is. If we didn't have conflict, we wouldn't need politics. Um, and when young people learn that you can actually talk about issues you disagree over with others without actually hating the other side, listening to them, that doesn't mean you necessarily agree with them, but you sort of learn to get accustomed to that. I think it actually helps. And I think we do um, all of ourselves, not just our young people, a, a huge disfavor by somehow shunting out politics and thinking that that's you know, not something that we should engage with when quite the opposite, I think we, we should. Um, but this isn't the Dave Campbell show, so I'm gonna move on to another question. But, <laughs> but you know, Dave, I would um, agree and disagree with that actually. Um, well, make, make up your mind. Do you agree or do you disagree? <laughs> um, We're gonna disagree about that, but we'll do it civilly. I, I would agree that uh, today we, we have more problems with engaging opposing viewpoints. Um, and so I'm gonna agree with that point. I'm, I'm gonna kind of disagree with why that is a new thing, why we see that today. And I wanna echo a point that Caitlin just brought up. And that is um, in today's society with technology um, and the media, we can customize the news that we receive. Two generations ago, we had three channels mm -hmm. and that's all we had. And we were compelled many times to listen to opposing viewpoints. Today, we can fully customize our friends through our social media. We can fully customize the media. We have thousands of channels that we can customize, that we turn to. Um, just today, I'm in my car and if a, if a song comes on that I don't like, I change it. I am not compelled to listen to something um, that I don't like. So I'm gonna customize my news. I'm gonna customize my entertainment. I'm gonna customize my friends. I'm gonna um, be selective on Facebook. So I'm, so I'm gonna surround myself in my own cocoon, even though we have this advanced technology, we have more channels today than we ever had before. And that just allows us to fully customize. And the more that we customize, the more extreme we become, the more polarized we become, and the less civil we become. And we've come a long way from when I was forced to listen to my parents' eight track tapes <laughs> as we went on long road trips. In those days, we didn't even have a Walkman, but uh, we've come a long way. One thing too, I thought of while you guys were talking and all that was so smart and super helpful. Um, but I also think culture plays into it in pop culture. And there was this really smart, I think it was New York Times Magazine, um, interview with Andy Cohen, who does all the Real Housewives and Bravo shows right before, they interviewed him before the 2016 election. And I think it published like December or January after, the, uh, after President Trump won the election. And he was talking about how he'd done these polls with the audience of people who watch Bravo. And they, they had said they thought Trump was gonna win. And he basically said, it's not surprising because when you see why my shows have been so successful, a lot of people who are yelling at each other and have nicknames for each other and get in these drag out fights. And I think when you look at it in the bigger context, I thought it was a really good point that it's kind of what people have become accustomed to, not now in politics, but also, you know, just in how TV has changed, um, entertainment has changed and it's what people were consuming. And so it doesn't seem as shocking maybe when it moves over to politics. Right. Well, Thank you, uh, Caitlin, for that observation, because that's actually a very nice segue into uh, the next question that I had that also came from one of our audience members. Um, it was directed toward you, although I'm happy to hear from Darren as well, if you want to talk a little bit about this. And th the question is, have you detected that there's been a change in the tone of 
political discourse. Um, that is, when you look at what the media is not just covering, but what they're actually doing and saying to one another and the types of programming that we have, is the level of discourse today that seems so contentious, is it worse than it has been in the past? Or do you just think that? Has it always been that way? You know, I would say it's been amplified. Um, and I think, you know, before I came to CBS News, my background was I did communications and I worked in politics um, for almost a decade. And I was on and off Capitol Hill, presidential campaigns, Senate campaigns. Um, and part of my job was what, what I considered as a spokesperson, I was in the media relations business. And even though there's a give and take with reporters and you might not agree over, they could be annoying you about a story that you really wish wouldn't be written. Um, I viewed it as my job to have respect and to develop relationships with people because you're both kind of doing the same job on opposite sides of the coin. Both have jobs to do, both have bosses, um, and you got to work together even though you might not be happy. They might be ticked off at me, I'm not giving them something, or that I gave a story to something somebody else. I might not be happy with how they characterize my boss in an article or on television. Um, but there is always a give and take. I think that at least now that I'm on the other side of things, um, in some ways I'm surprised um, that that camaraderie, and I don't know if it was always there and I just didn't see it because that was just the way I operated. Um, but I think a little bit of that um, has gone away. Um, and I also think, at least when I worked on Capitol Hill um, and on campaigns, I had plenty of friends who worked on the other side um, and that you have to deal with on press conferences, if your bosses are working on a bill together um, and there's just was a mutual respect. Um, so I haven't done that in a long time. So I really don't know if that exists anymore. Um, but I think that's one experience that I had that just based on the rhetoric you hear. Um, and you know, last week, um, every Supreme Court battle is like totally polarized. Um, each thing now I feel like it's just like you're on one side or the other. And I felt like when I was working in politics, they, there was still a lot of that, um, but you were also, working across the aisle in many ways. Mm -hmm. I remember many years ago when I was an intern in Washington, D.C., when I was in college, um, I was really struck by the fact that at that time, Democrats and Republicans often did get along. They disagreed politically, but they could agree that they cared about politics. And so when they were in Washington, politics was the only thing you talked about, right? If you're in Hershey, Pennsylvania, you talk about chocolate. If you're in Washington, DC, you talk about politics. Um, and they sort of had a common bond there, but I do wonder if maybe that's no longer the case. Darren, I'm curious, what, what do you think? Is the tone of political discourse really that much worse today or do we just think it's worse because we're living through it? No, it's bad. It's worse. <laughs> it is worse than it used to be. Um, and, I'm going to go back to what I said about um, our ability now to customize our friends. We are increasingly uh, networked with people who share our same partisanship and our same ideology and our same political beliefs. We no longer are reaching out across the aisle to form friendships and to establish networks with people who express different ideas than we do. Mm -hmm. And so when we actually come in contact and try to engage, um, well, actually, we try not to engage people who are different than we are. We try not to engage people who have different political viewpoints. But when we do come in contact with people who express different opinions than ours, um, it's a new experience. It's a new experience. <clears throat> we don't know how to disagree. Uh, we don't know um, how to be civil toward one, e one another. We often view opposing viewpoints as threatening and challenging. Um, we didn't always used to do that. Mm -hmm. We didn't always used to be uh, that way. And I, I actually attribute it to greater customization. We are very selective of our friend groups. We're very selective of people that we associate with. 
we are all walking around in our tight little bubbles, our political bubbles, um, and um, we need to relearn how to disagree. Um, I, I can say, and I'm guessing that um, Darren would agree that as a professor at Notre Dame, certainly one of the things we hope to do in political science courses, but this would be you know, true across the liberal arts is, is teach students how to engage with one another. So they learn how to disagree and also how to defend their position. Because I do fear that often what happens when people enter into a political discussion, because they're in the sorts of bubbles that Darren is describing, they aren't used to having to defend their views. So they haven't really thought them through. So they actually have a hard time articulating what it is that has led them to hold the position that they do. And so when they're confronted with contrary evidence, it's very disorienting because they haven't really thought about that. So they don't really know what to say and it just gets frustrating for them. Um, I'm gonna turn now to a, a different question also on the theme of, po of polarization. Um, an interesting question that came in about potential milestones or turning points that we've had either in the distant past or maybe in the recent past that have led to our current state of polarization? That is, are, are, there, are there things that have happened along the way that have brought us to this place that if we could rewind the clock, maybe we would have done them differently, or at least we could point and say, okay, that's, that's one of the reasons why we are where we are. Um, do either of you have any thoughts on what have been, have been you know, sort of signal important turning points? Um. My immediate thought is the issue of causality, um, that perhaps we're looking at this the wrong way. Perhaps the way we should be looking at this is uh, what has that civility created, not whether these independent milestones have created the incivility, but it's the incivility that have led to certain types of milestones. Oh. Um, and so for instance, um, the most obvious form of incivility um, in the last 10 years that I can think of is during President Obama's State of the Union address. And um, out of protocol, there is a member from the House who actually objected and, and shouted at President Obama. Uh, called him a was, right, called him a liar. We should remember that's specifically what call, he said. We called him a liar. I don't know if Obama was lying or not, but that was so much of a departure from tradition. Um, and um, so I see that incivility actually leading to those events, not those events um, creating incivility. So it's an interesting example of how we have almost a feedback loop. So. Yeah. Something like that incident happens that feeds a further sense of division and polarization, which in turn leads to more events, which in turn leads to greater division, um, right. which is maybe not a cheerful thought, but <laughs> there it is. Caitlin, I'm curious, from your perspective, have there been particular moments or incidents or events that you would point to and say, well, yeah, actually, that does seem to be something that's significant that has maybe led to further polarization or thrown gasoline on the fire, if you will? You know, I tend to agree with Darren. Um, it was really well put, well said. Um, I just think that, again, it goes back to that echo chamber and kind of this mentality in America right now that all press is good press. So if you say something and your, your base likes it, your supporters like it, your friends like it, it encourages you to do more of that, to, you know, if you're in politics, to fundraise all of it. Um, so I think it's that, I don't know when it started, if there's any big event, but I just think in terms of being able to again, choose your own news, pick who you follow on Twitter, um, get that instant gratification and feedback. Um, if you're not hearing the other side or can mute the other side, I think it's probably pretty tempting to keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And one thing that we should also note in terms of the, um, the customization of the media that we consume that is also, that fact is exploited by political campaigns because uh, political campaigns, of course, can target their messaging very narrowly based on what they know about us from you know, our social media usage and where we live and all sorts of things in a way that was much more difficult in the past 
you know, you could run television ads during particular shows or on particular channels. And that was a little bit of targeting, but you were still painting with a pretty broad brush compared to what you have um, today. And I think that also means that you have people receiving messages that are so tailored to them that it can really inflame them in a way that perhaps we haven't seen in the past. We are um, almost out of time. And so I just wanted to, before we wrap things up, um, just ask whether either of you have any final thoughts. There was an interesting question that was posed here about if we had a magic wand. What, what would we do differently? Is there anything we could do differently to bring about more civil discourse? That, that's a tough question. And maybe you want to leave that one for another day. But at the very least, I want to give you the opportunity to uh, maybe make a, just a brief closing statement, and then we'll wrap things up. Darren, why don't we start with you? Um, if I had a magic wand, um, I think I'd get rid of this pandemic. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, I think um, our social networks are increasingly important. Like the people we talk to, the people we associate with. And um, I think it's important that we develop very diverse social networks um, that we can try out different ideas. I tell my students all the time, you know, friends are great, but friends are even better if they help you get rid of bad ideas. Um, so um, I just kind of like to emphasize uh, creating more diverse social networks and um, challenging um, many of our pre existing ideas. Thank you. Um... Caitlin, magic wand, or um, any other closing thoughts? Yeah, no, I think just along Darren's lines and what I was talking about earlier with our coverage, I think from the media standpoint, just as much as you can get out of your bubble, um, that is one thing I have been really, really striving to do with our team, make sure that they're hearing from people from different backgrounds, different geography, um, different philosophies and opinions, um, because I just think that's good and it's important and it makes our coverage richer and it provides more context. And the more voices we have, the more the people who do watch us um, are hearing from them and seeing their perspective and where they're coming from. Uh, and I think, you know, with the why of voting, um, it's like, why do people bother showing up? Uh, that's the most important we can, question we can answer. Um, this year of the how of voting <laughs> takes on equally significant importance and we can't take our eye off that. But I just think it's the age old question of what drives people to the polls. Um, and we can have all the polling we want. Uh, but when you don't have faces behind that, I think um, we can't really bring those polls and what we're seeing in our data to life. And that's really important. Thank you. Um, I am so grateful for the comments and thoughtful ideas that both of you have shared today. Um, and I, I hope our audience um, is also able to recognize uh, wh what a great thing it is to be able to bring uh, two experts together and, and have a discussion like this. And I know there's a lot more we could say. The subject of polarization is deep. And of course, we all want to talk about the presidential campaign and how that either feeds into polarization or might be a consequence of it. But we're out of time. So we'll have to leave many of those thoughts for future conversations, but I would hope that our audience members will carry on these conversations um, and maybe find somebody to talk to who doesn't necessarily agree with you. You may actually find you have more common ground uh, than you, you might think. Um, I hold out some hope that maybe there's something out there that people can agree on. And maybe Darren can go back to assigning his students the assignment where they have to go find a polling question where people are not so sharply divided. Um, just in our closing moments here, let me note that um, there will be another Bridging the Divide session next Tuesday, October 13th. In that session, there'll be a discussion of racial and social injustice and inequality in America. So hardly a light conversation, but obviously a very important one and one that's taken on increasing significance uh, over the last few months. The goal of that session is to promote change through greater understanding of the issues of inequality and racial and social injustice. One of my uh, favorite sayings here at Notre Dame is that we all seek to be a force for good in the world. 
And um, I hope that this conversation, I hope that the next conversation, I hope that all of the subsequent Bridging the Divide sessions are an opportunity for us as the Notre Dame community to come together, to reflect on these important issues during this important time and be a force for good and maybe try to bring about some change in the world. If you're interested in learning more about the Bridging the Divide, the Divide series, um, you can do so at provost.nd.edu. That's provost.nd.edu. And with that, I will close and wish you all a good evening. Thank you very much for your participation. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Go Irish. <laughs> Thank you, Dave.